Thank you very, very much, Andreas. People are clapping. I can hear it here and see it also on the screen. Um, thank you very much for giving us a good overview of um, what is happening in the Declare project. Um, and uh, thanks also to the PhD students. Several of them are in the audience and are probably also available to ask any questions uh, that are specifically uh, to them. Um, I would like to open the discussion um, and just sort of put into everybody's minds the, the various aspects that Andreas has covered. So you, you moved from um, the, the microdosing experiments over food technology, uh, over animal production, uh, to land tenure mapping um, and, and, and closed the uh, circle. Um, by talking about agroforestry modeling um, activities. And I, I think this is an admirable breadth of activities that you do. And I'm, I'm pretty certain that uh, there are several amongst the group here that I can see that will have some questions to you on, uh, on different aspects. The floor is open for any questions. Anybody wants to have the first shot? I would certainly be willing to share the slides again, or if you have noted the numbers, that would be particularly helpful. Um, I removed them so that we can see each other um, at this stage. That's perfectly okay. Good. I have Pilot and then Frank. Please go ahead, Pilot. Maybe quickly. Okay. Thank you very much. Of, uh, yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank the presenter. Uh, for all the good information he has shared with us. So I have just two quick concerns. The first one, the micro dosing. Um, in, I think the overall, of the overall objective of the project has to do with the sustainable management. So why did the project um, choose to use um, a chemical fertilizer? Why not in the dosing uh, did you did the project not use a, an organic fertilizer? Because in the dosing you use the NPK, which is a chemical fertilizer. So don't you think this um, reduce the sustainability of uh, many many things? The second concern I do have uh, the land tenure. One of the conclusions of the presentation is that the land tenure increased um, food security by 3.5, I think. So um, I would like to know, are we talking about the, um, is the project talking about the formal land tenure or um, the indigenous land tenure has been taken into account? Since in the rural regions at, at our place, the formal land tenure um, is really uh, critical. I mean, the applicability of the formal land tenure is a critical challenge. Did you account for the indigenous land tenure? Thank you, please. Thank you very much for your question. Let me try to start um, from the end. Um, we are fully aware that in Sub-Saharan West Africa, there is several layers that determine access to land. There is the traditional land tenure, there is the modern French imposed one, um, which follows Western um, bookkeeping approaches, if you wish, and then there is customary rights, um, plus there is some interfamily um, use use rights and this is a very complex interplay that needs to be in each individual case considered when you discuss about innovations now for instance if you do tree planting that is uh, very important that's why we don't do it because there is a big mess when you decide about tree planting who is going to own the tree what does that mean for the ownership of the land um, but we work with innovations and uh, look at innovations that are either indigenous, in the Wagashi case, for instance, or that are new, such as the microdosing. And now we come to your first question. I do believe, and I do that as a member of the 
Faculty of Organic Agricultural Sciences at the University of Kassel that there is no way um, for sustainable um, management of land in Sub-Saharan West Africa than by the judicious mixture of mineral fertilizers and of organic amendments. And these organic amendments use manure, uh, comp comprise manure, they comprise crop residues, and they comprise certainly also the fostering of agroforestry systems. Why am I saying that? Soils in West Africa are amongst the most leached in the world. I've worked for 30 years on these soils and was able to compare them with East African soils, with soils um, in Asia. There is nothing poorer in terms of the soil fertility, particular phosphorus, nitrogen, and sulfur, potassium, than West Africa. And there is no way with a rising population and with the continuous flux of nutrients from rural areas to urban areas, as it has been for hundreds of years now, but now it's tremendously accelerated because you have these big cities, then to replenish the nutrients and you have to do that by external inputs. No sustainable agriculture in West Africa no sustainable agriculture without an external input, but they have to be effectively and efficiently applied. And microdosing is particularly such an approach that mimics farmers' um, technology, farmers' <laughs> knowledge keeping of knowing about the fertility of their field. It's basically precision agriculture, and the amounts are only one tenth to one fifth of what is recommended by the government. So no negative effect on the environment. I can't see that after 30 years of experiments. Okay, Pilo, satisfied with the answer, Pilo, or? <laughs> yeah, it is okay. <laughs> Good. Good, okay, thank you. From... But I'm not the fertilizer industry, right? I'm saying mix, <laughs> mixing, mixing small amounts <laughs> of external mineral fertilizer with traditional knowledge, with the soil fertility maintenance technologies that the farmers use and with manure and crop residues. An integrated integrated approach. Yes. Okay, thanks very much. Frank, you are next and after you, Dokas. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. It's quite impressive <clears throat> to see all the things that are going on in Declare. Um, I was wondering uh, about the microdosing um, it seems a very efficient method, but if I understood it correctly, it also means additional workload. So how do you argue in order to convince the farmers to adopt this uh, technology? Um, yes, we have um, intensively worked on that also during the last decades. It really depends on the system. In Burkina, farmers themselves, there was no foreign advice, um, have developed seed comb fertilizer equipment. So um, if you go to Saria, they have a small industry and dozens of uh, those units are being uh, distributed. They are pulled by animals or they can be pushed by the farmer. Now, if you don't have that, what's usually happening is that um, farmers uh, do that planting together with their women. At least for millet, that's the case. In maize, not always depending on the region. So yes, there is some additional uh, workload needed. No free ride in nature, no free ride in agriculture. Um, mixing them with the seed won't work well because particular when the rains are not very strong, you do have a salt effect then on the seeds. So um, you have seed burning and that you want by all means to avoid. So yes, additional labor, absolutely right. Um, we have seen on tens of thousands of farmers that it was not a major constraint. But the constraint, of course, gets bigger the higher the density. Now, if you are talking about an intensive system where you have um, 50,000 plants or 100,000 plants per hectare, intensive maize, then please don't do microdosing. Do broadcast application. You have a modern system. You may even do tractor plowing. Then the mold is a different one. We are looking at still the semi-arid uh, subhumid uh, zones or even uh, zones islands in larger dry areas where uh, agriculture is semi-intensive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Maybe a follow-up question from my side, Andreas. Do you do you put these uh, informations into a decision support system, saying under these and these conditions, microdosing is the right thing to do, under this and this condition not? And maybe exactly. match it also with some economic data, like this is the exactly. additional labor intensity or the labor input, and you get so much more out of it? That's true, and there is my good old colleague Ludger, who um, told me many times to finish that work. And uh, uh, if I wasn't traveling around that much, I would have done mm -hmm. it so. But I promise that in the next three months, I will finish this. So parametrizing the microdosing is a challenging task, but it's not easy because if it was only for a minute, it's quickly done. But as it is now being propagated uh, for sorghum, for maize at different densities, and including for vegetables, mm -hmm. um, because the kickoff effect is always the same. And that has to do with this, with the region. We usually have unpredictable rainfalls. We have, after the onset of the season, we have stresses, sandstorms, or we have animals that roam around. So you want the um, seedlings of all crops quickly leaving the, the seedling stage. And that's uh, a very important thing. Um, if uh, the seeding stage is overcome, then the roots are growing okay, and then um, native P, native nitrogen can be taken up. So the kickstart effects means that you have to differentiate very clearly between the individual crops in terms of amount and uh, exact application technology. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Good, Dukas, thank you very much for being patient. So the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation and for the information shared with us. I just want to have a follow-up question. Um, the way Pilo asked about the uh, organic fertilizer, um, microdosing without organic fertilizer, how do we account for the soil organic matter given that it's already low in West Africa? And we know that inorganic fertilizer will not really help on that. Do you Absolutely. have any insight? Yes, yes, of course. Um, the sustainable fertility management needs to look at both mineral soil fertility and organic carbon. And we are not even talking about lifting organic carbon because that's hardly pos possible at the high turnover rate. What we are doing is we want to basically slow the decline that is happening through permanent cultivation, slow that down, or in the best cases, maintain organic carbon under cultivation. I think more than that in West Africa would be desirable, but is not realistic. Now, that having said, um, any improved growth of a plant, being it a cereal or being it a vegetable, will lead to enhanced carbon fixation, which means there is more biomass produced, not only as grain, if you have a grain crop, but also as stover. And more biomass means either it is being recycled as crop residue mulch, or it's going as fodder into the animals, or it's being used to construct houses and eventually also return to the field because these houses <laughs> decay. And then the reconstitution of the organic matter at least partly happens. So I do believe that any enhanced plant growth, any enhanced biomass production, is to the advantage of the carbon balance of the system. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Dokas also is happy with that, very good. So I would like to give the word to Tina. <laughs> also wanted to add a question. Yeah, well, thanks a lot to you and to the whole Declare team for compiling so many results already. I was quite impressed um, how much you have um, achieved and it was really interesting to listen. Um, I have one, it's probably rather a comment to the findings um, regarding the land tenure and, and the survey you did in Ghana. Um, uh, we, we discussed uh, several times also with, with Sakaria on that, that um, regarding gender, I think you didn't really uh, much distinguish actually between um, women and male managed plus within farm households. And from our preliminary work, so in the workshop, we actually found that women within the households do not have land in your security at all and really struggle. So it would be maybe nice to, if you have any data on that, to also present maybe the yep. challenges around these uh, land tenure issues um, in Ghana. I don't know about Benin, so I can't talk about that. And um, then I have one question regarding the participatory land tenure mapping in Benin. Um, I found the results really interesting. So I was wondering, um, 
if the if the person who who did this um, the study um, in Benin could maybe tell a little bit about the the method or how it was done, or maybe you can do it. Um, no, I will. I will not. That uh, <laughs> somebody will, else. So, somebody so else does. But 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 before yeah. before we start <laughs> on that, I think I uh, it was due to the time that I could not differentiate between men and women's access right to land because it's much more complicated than one may actually uh, say. So I um, talked about the household, mm -hmm. right? That households are not worried about a land tenure. But um, if we look, for instance, at grazing grounds, there it's male who decides. If we look at trees, things get much more complicated. Because for cashew trees, it was traditionally women who are running the cashew trees. And women are deciding about how to harvest those trees, how to um, deal with those trees. Now, if trees are chopped down and converted into charcoal, then all of a sudden, again, it becomes a male story. So um, it's not that we are not aware and that we haven't collected data on this, but I was just in 20 minutes not able to go on those differentiations. But having said that, now please, I would like to turn to any possible uh, social anthropologist who is here among the audience, which I cannot see because I only see five small images here. <laughs> okay, Aloha. Sapong, do you want to shed some light on this <laughs> question? Welcome. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, so what we did was that so the participation antenna mapping, we wanted to make it simple. Already there was, um, um, we had taken um, the spatial map of the entire place using drones. So we had access to the entire um, space in um, where we tested it is Bukusera specifically. So we had the drone map. Then we want we didn't want to use any sophisticated uh, digital tools. So what we used was that we engaged the local people. We went um, to their various homes. We started first with the the various leaders in the the the, the how do we call it the village. So we identified areas, for instance, areas that are so common to everybody. Um, for instance, the rivers, the dam, public areas, communal lands, and what have you. Then when we had finished, we then went to their various homes. So um, with the various homes, we used the markets for people to plot their, their land. So that's how we did it. So that was the first stage. And what was interesting was that you, you'll be thinking probably, why didn't we use any digital tools? But some of the spaces that people had plotted with, with markets, when we had uh, confirmed it with their neighbors, even without their absence or without their presence when we're doing it, they were still able to confirm that indeed this is the plot or this is my plot this is where my limit ends mm -hmm. so that was the first stage and i'm sure there are other questions so if later on we want more information about the tenor map and how we did it because there are so many other information related to this and mm -hmm. one of them in particular is also with tenor rights in terms of women so mm -hmm. we also did that how women have access to lands and other indicators as well thank you Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Now, Peter. I would like to add to add one more. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. It was just mentioned drone flights. Now, drone flying is a complex issue. There is on the one hand side the permission of the government that you get, you get or you don't get. On the other side, you need to make sure that the policemen are happy. Um, <laughs> that is a, lo a local issue that has nothing to do with a formal permit. And then finally, and I think that's the most important, that the villagers are happy because finally you are collecting their properties, photos on from their premises. And um, that is often forgotten that people obtain a government permit and then they start flying saying, well, the government has told me, but the indigenous, so to speak, rights of personality that we here in Europe hold so highly is simply not applied to West Africa. Therefore, we usually start, start from the different level. We start at the communal level and then move up. Good. Peter has a question. Yes. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I have some comments to make regarding the micro dosing. So in Northern Ghana, we had a stakeholder uh, workshop with participants from different uh, agricultural systems, from, from those from soil scientists, those from government, uh, gender, private sector, and then uh, we had to do some exercise with respect to microdosing, how it is feasible within their context. 
And one of the issues that came up was that uh, microdosing per your experiment was you were using 1.5 gram. And uh, a senior scientist who is also into crop indicated that 1.5 gram once poor the farming season may not be sustainable. That is one of the issues that came up. That uh, if you apply just 1.5 gram and you tell the farmer not to apply anything again, any fertilizer or any dose again throughout the season, uh, they question about the sustainability of, of it because you are looking at in the two northern regions, in Savannah and the northern region, the soils are, two, are different. In Savannah, they have uh, virgin forest or virgin land. So if you advise a farmer to do that, that is possible. But in the north, in northern region, that is not possible. So I want to find out the results. Is it from only the Savannah where there is an increase or it is from both the Savannah and the northern region? Sorry, there is some noise here in the background. Some library visitors are starting. So let's hope that you understand me. Um, we do have tens of thousands of data sets in the uh, meantime. And we see that we have microdosing effects all across levels of fertilization. So if a farmer is wealthy, if a farmer produces for a market and is sure that the rains are good, there is no obstacle of him applying first the kickoff dose, so this 1.5 microdosing, and then apply some broadcast fertilization. Of course, that also uh, is a question of how um, his density of the crop is. If he has 10,000 plants, which is one plant per square uh, meter, which is typically for the Sahelian zone, if you look at Sorghum or look at Millet, then he is um, okay with the microdosing because broadcast would be a waste of the fertilizer. And as we have seen before, um, the um, soil waterfront would just move very quickly through the profile and he will have tremendous losses, particularly of nitrogen. Now we have originally um, conceived the microdosing mm -hmm. in such a way that um, at a planting rate of between 10 and 15,000 um, planting hills per hectare, um, you do have the phosphorus amount supplied, the phosphorus that is extracted by the grain, and it's most of the piece actually in the grain and not in the straw. The nitrogen will not be supplied to full, and the remaining nitrogen uptake is actually coming from the mineralization uh, at, that would be lost otherwise due to the rain front coming in and the water then moving through the soil profile. Still, you are likely for nitrogen to run at the lower end. And once more, if a farmer then combines microdosing with manure application, all the better. Microdosing does not mean to replace more fertilizer, but it's an entry door and it's a survival door and it's a sustainability door for farmers to start making money from agriculture and eventually then being able to intensify. Okay, so this is a matter of communication and um, and, um, and interesting enough, although it was developed, here. Yeah. yes, and also as it was developed for the West African Sahel, interesting enough, it's all all throughout Africa. If you look through the literature now, you have um, microdosing from Zimbabwe, you have microdosing from East Africa, and this whole story with the vegetables that it was never conceived of. So the basic concept is allow farmers to determine the seeding rate, allow understanding his, his um, precision agriculture and combine it with whatever he wants to do, just to allow kickoff because early plant growth is key all over Africa, maybe except for South Africa, to survival of the crop. So it's really a matter of communicating and conveying that this is not a dogma, but mm -hmm. this is a kickstart and then the farmers. Yep. And, and it's an, an option, and I, I, I quite like the idea of this precision, you know, the precision uh, farming, which, which allows saving of inputs. That's cool. And it is also a way of, I would say, re-evaluating the skills of African farmers. I have greatest respect after 30 years of working there for the skills of West African and of African farmers in general. When I arrived there as a PhD student, what I was told at ICRISAT was, you know, 
no farmers here they really don't know to how how to farm we have to show them how to do modern farming this misconception since colonial times even there was until the 1990s i hope that it's better now but during my student time so to speak in west africa that was still the dogma and that devaluated those that survived under those conditions to the advantage or say mental disadvantage of the academicians who barely came in certainly didn't live off agriculture but lived off the salary that was paid by external uh, sources that's not fair and that is not taking justice of the millennia old skills of west africans Especially those those who know how the the climatic yes. situation is, yeah. Sure. Yes. Cool. Um, I've got Frank, but just give me a minute, um, Frank, because uh, Karina and Lange unfortunately had to leave, and she posted a question into the chat. Well, a a suggestion of possible collaboration between the Minodu and the Declare project. So that's something, uh, a message that I certainly want to make sure doesn't get lost. Uh, and she was also asking um, to get a little bit more information about how the interface of the decision support system should actually work and how the farmers are able to, to use it. Um, that may not be something you need to answer right now because Karina is not here, but I just wanted to convey it and, and Tan also for your information that you may, um, you may get in touch with Karina and, and discuss maybe some of these um, possible interactions. Okay, Frank. Um... I don't really know how to start this question, but maybe it's mostly linked to, to your survey, um, where it comes out that the trees and the management of the trees is mainly with the women, while the survival, so to speak, um, is more by the decision of the men. And I was wondering um, how the value of the trees is perceived by the people. Because when we were in Ghana last year, we met a, a farmer who is doing really commercialized business with agriculture. And what he did is he cleared uh, all the trees in his fields in order to have a simpler life with his machines. So uh, he's heavily mechanized. And of course, um, going with a tractor around the trees is, um, yeah. Well, in his eyes, trees were an obstacle, so he decided to remove them. And I was wondering, is this a, a common future picture if um, farming is being developed further? Or is there a recognition of the value of the trees um, beyond um, some additional money and also uh, yeah, in, an, in an agronomic way because the, the trees have a an, um, function in the system? Thank you. Throughout Africa, my experience is that tree have many functions. Um, there is in some regions and with some trees, the baobab is one example, also a religious function. Um, a religious to the degree that it's the honoring the ancestors that the tree has to remain. It cannot be cut. And you see that in a tragic way also in the sand winning um, areas in around Accra, where the machinery has been used to remove the entire surface soil to a depth of two meters um, for sand extraction. And the only thing that is remaining in the field, I can send you pictures, are uh, these baobab trees um, on small little plots of let's say five by five meters eventually they will all fall down but then it's nature that makes them fall down right it's not the caterpillar that has uh, turned it over so there is this part of the story uh, that depends on the area that depends uh, certainly on the tree and it depends on the competition for the tree because these so-called holy trees um, get also um, threatened once um, there is a charcoal business coming. And we have recently quantified the amount of charcoal that is extracted from rural areas and have uh, gone through all these main axes, uh, RN2, RN3 in, Ga in Burkina, and this is, uh, uh, sorry, in, in uh, Benin, in Benin. And huge amounts of um, trees are being cut down and often indiscriminately, although there are some trees that are better to produce charcoal than there are others. 
And then there is last, the revival of trees. Now these are cashews and sheep butter. Uh, throughout the zones, throughout Ghana and uh, Burkina and Benin, um, we see it even in parts of Niger now, um, people start to appreciate the market opportunities of the sheep butter tree. And cashew is, is the real running uh, issue. And uh, if I remember 30 years ago, there was barely a cashew tree now along the Paran from uh, Paraku down uh, south. Uh, to Cotonou, you see one plantation after the next. So uh, trees are not equal to trees. Also, the management of the trees, gender issue-wise, needs to be better understood. I would be hesitant to do generalization on this. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm just looking around whether there are any more questions for the time being, but it seems that, Andreas, you have answered all the questions. And I would like to thank you and especially also the team of PhD students in the Declare project for generating these very interesting uh, data that you have presented on their behalf and for your sharing your experience from 30 and more years in, in West Africa, which of course gives a completely different view again on the, mm -hmm. on the spot uh, information that, 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 uh, that we are working with normally. So thank you very, very much for giving us that insight. Good luck to the Declare team for continuous presentations. I should like to mention to you that we have the status seminar uh, for all the projects coming up next June. So in about 12 months time, we shall all meet in Accra. And that's the, the time that the students can also speak for themselves and uh, you know go further in depth with, with their research results and share them uh, with all of us. So that's already for you to, to know and to plan. Uh, and I should also like to announce the next Interfaces Colloquium will be given by COINS, by Frank and his team, also on the 11th of July. So please mark that date already and uh, join us again. And thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, Andreas, that you joined us uh, under difficult conditions in a public space. Um, but we are very glad that that worked out quite well, uh, despite the occasional little uh, interferences. Thank, thank you. you very much, Chani, uh, Hannah, for a very professional setup for um, announcing it so widely and for uh, your function of holding the threads together. I think with such high quality students, with such a commitment of the uh, postdocs also working um, towards the fulfillment of our goals, we are really blessed to have the serious solid funding of the ministry and um, of the collaboration that is established. And um, I particularly welcome that. Thank you.